Now, what happens next? Just as Elijah and Moses are about to depart from the scene, Peter asks Jesus if the disciples could make three tents, three tabernacles for him and the two prophets. Now, in theology circles, the, the request by Peter to build these three tents receives much pontification as to the motive behind Peter's attempt to keep the prophets there longer. Biblical scholars argue Peter was trying to offer them the opportunity to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I have my own opinion. However, I'm not going to go there. Scripture tells us Peter did not know what he was saying. Yeah, we get it. You don't need to be a rocket scientist theologian to understand you don't invite ascended beings to spend the night. Let's not split hairs here. The only thing that really matters to us in the here and now is that these are significant visitors. And the hospitable Peter thought it might be a good idea to invite them to stay a while. And let's just leave it at that. Notice what happens next. Before Peter could finish speaking, a cloud appears and covers them. It engulfs them, and a voice from the cloud speaks to them. At this point, there should be no doubt in anyone's mind whose voice the disciples heard speaking. It is unmistakably the voice of Almighty God, the great I am that I am, Yahweh, conceivably speaking in an audible human voice. And here is what God said. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now watch this. I love the details in scriptures, and you'll love this too. This is not coincidence. This is providence. The expression, listen to him, appears in the, first appears in the first covenant, in the book of of Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, where Moses prophesies about the coming of Jesus, the coming Messiah, which reads as follows. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. You might want to make a note of the fact that Moses was born in 1522 B.C. and died in the year 1402 B.C., which means that Moses spoke those prophetic words of the Messiah's coming over a thousand years earlier. Now jump forward in time back to the New Covenant to the story of Jesus' transfiguration, and now we hear God speaking those same words, you must listen to him. Anytime we find in the Bible God speaking directly to human beings, it is important. It's very important. And therefore, we need to draw from the biblical account of the transfiguration of Jesus a personalized, individualized message from God. And I add this next verse to support why I say that. John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus is emphatically telling us, my sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus tells us to listen to his voice, his word, and to follow him. Prophesizing of Jesus, Moses tells us to listen to God's prophet, and God tells us to listen to Christ. Sounds like good advice to me, because anytime you have three or more experts in total agreement on an issue— you don't need to think about it. Just do it. Listen and obey Jesus Christ. Question. What's the significance of the cloud? Now, I ask this because I believe the cloud is an extremely significant event in this story. This is a night to remember. Jesus is transfigured into his glory, of his, the glory of his godliness. And the prophets, Moses and Elijah, appear. And now a cloud covers them, and from the cloud, the Lord God speaks. So the question is, what is the significance of the cloud? No, let, let me ask it this way. What is the first thing that came to your mind when you heard 
the cloud coming over them. Think about it. What comes to mind? Here's what comes to my mind. And let this become part of your mindset as you share this story of the transfiguration of Jesus with your family and your friends. The disciples were students of the writings of Moses in which they read the story of the Israelites' exodus from Egypt and how the Lord God used a cloud to guide the Israelites through the desert. To refresh your memory, let me read to you Exodus chapter 40, verse 38. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day and fire above it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. The word cloud is often referred to as the glory of God, or in Hebrew, the Shekinah of Yahweh, which incidentally, the word Shekinah does not appear in the Bible, so don't look for it. But according to Jewish theology, Shekinah is a Hebrew translation meaning the visible manifestation of the divine presence of God. Let me ask you, uh, no, no, no. Let me, let me give you just a few more verses. Take a look at Exodus 24 to start. Exodus 24. The glory of the Lord Yahweh resided, dwelt on the Mount Sinai, and the cloud, the presence of God, covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, God called to Moses from within the cloud. That's Exodus 24, verse 16. Now let's take a look at Exodus 40. The cloud covered the tent of the meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Exodus 40, verse 34. Next verse. But Moses was not able to enter the tent of the meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Exodus 40, verse 35. And one more. The priests could not carry out their duties because the cloud, the Lord's glory, filled his temple. That's 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 11. The shadow of things to come is being revealed to us in those verses. God is revealing to us that his glory would be made available to us and dwell within us through Jesus Christ. That is God's purpose. Now, watch this. Look at what happens next. The, di the disciples then fall to the ground in fear. Yeah, I think I'd be afraid too. Jesus approaches his disciples and touches them, telling them not to be afraid. And I could imagine they had their heads covered with their arms in fear. And when the disciples look up, the cloud is gone. And so are Elijah and Moses. And Jesus is now transfigured back into his human form. The event ended as unexpected as it started. So what have we learned so far? Well, if there's anything that I want you to take away from this message, it's this. We know as a fact the glory of God, the presence of God, the Shekinah of Yahweh, remained with the Israelites in the desert at the temple. No one disputes this fact. We know it is true, and there is no doubt in our mind that God manifested himself to the Israelites in a form that they could accept. The evidence is indisputable. Therefore, based on the evidence, beyond any doubt, just as the glory, the presence of God, abides with the Israelites at the temple, the glory of God remains and abides and exists in Jesus, making Jesus the living temple of God. Jesus is the living temple of God. Now wait, it gets better. When Moses led the Israelites from physical bondage to the promised land, the cloud of God, the presence of God, the Spirit of God, led God's people in the form of a cloud. In other words, God guided and abided his people in spirit form. And unto this day, the Spirit of God, the presence of God, through Jesus Christ, is guiding and abiding you and I. Do you see that? The presence of God, the glory of God. 
the Christ of God is Jesus. And Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is guiding and abiding us. For it is written, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. That's Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Make the connection. See it in your mind. And let those words adhere to your heart and your mind. Jesus is a guiding and abiding us right now. Don't just take my word for it. Open your own Bible. Read it for yourself. In fact, I don't want you to take my word for it. But you do need to take Jesus' word for it. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father residing in me performs his miraculous deeds. That's John 14, verse 10. Now, next verse. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not believe me, believe because the miraculous deeds themselves. John 14, 11. Question. Why is this so incredibly important to you and I? Because speaking of his second coming, Jesus said, At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. That's John 14, verse 20. God abides in Jesus, and Christ abides in us, and we abide in him. How awesome can that be? Our faith allows us to abide in Christ. Praise God. For the glory of God, which abides in Jesus, now abides in us. We are the temple, the tabernacle, in which the Spirit of God abides this is your identity. In fact, the Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians, For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will live in them and will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. I'm sorry, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, emphasis mine. And so I close with this thought. In Luke 9, the disciples are in the presence of Almighty Creator God. They see with their own eyes the cloud, the glory of God, the Shekinah of Yahweh, and they hear with their own ears God speaking. And God tells them that Jesus, Yahshua, is his son and that they need to listen to him, follow him. Just days prior to his brutal torture and horrific crucifixion, Jesus promises eternal life to those who call on his name and follow him. Jesus tells us, when you lift up the Son of Man, Jesus is talking about his own crucifixion, then you will know that I am he, who? The Christ of God. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak just what the Father taught me. That's John chapter 8, verse 28, emphasis mine. The story of the transfiguration of Jesus describes the first time Jesus appeared to us as a glorified divine being, as the Christ, in his glory, as a supernatural being, because Jesus is the personification of God in the flesh, the Messiah of God. When the disciples wrote about the transfiguration of Jesus, they wanted us to know what they saw, and they saw his glory. They saw Jesus full of grace and truth, the one and only who came from God, and that they saw Jesus for who he truly is, the Christ of God. Now, Peter drives home this point in Acts 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
And for those of you who are end time enthusiasts, let me share with you a verse which I know you'll appreciate because it, it really brings home this point. When the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of, the, of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's Revelations chapter 11, verse 15. What does this all mean to you and I today? What this means is that Jesus is who the Bible says he is. Jesus is the Christ of God. Jesus is the Messiah, Yeshua Mashiach, the Anointed One, our Savior and our Redeemer. Amen. John chapter 1.1 1, 1 is, is one of my favorite verses, and I suggest that you memorize it word for word. The clarity of this verse is incredible. Listen and appreciate how John in chapter 1 verse 1 describes who Jesus really is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now skip down to verse 14 and read along with me as John proclaims who Jesus is. Now the Word became flesh and took up residence among us. We saw his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth, who came from the Father. That's John chapter 1, verse 14. In simple, everyday terms, Jesus is the living Word of God. Jesus was with God long before there was light in the universe, long before the heavens and the earth were formed. Jesus existed in his glorified state of being as the living word of God. And when Jesus became flesh, he lived in such a manner as to demonstrate to us that God exists and that it is almighty creator God's yearning desire to abide with and in us. And it is through Jesus that we can and we shall receive eternal life in the kingdom of God. Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. That's in John 17, verse 5. If you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, invite him into your heart, your mind, and your soul, and let the Spirit of God abide within you. Bottom line, the transfiguration of Jesus is biblical. The biblical account of Jesus' transfiguration provides indisputable evidence that Jesus is the Christ of God. And praise God and glory be to God who has revealed and declared unto us that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Christ of God. For it is through Jesus that you and I have reconciliation, that we have salvation and eternal life with God. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. I enjoyed making it for you, and I hope that you got something out of it, that it spiritually blessed you or edified you in some way. At the very least, uh, I hope it entertained you. I enjoy making these videos for you, and the message that I want to get across to you is that God loves you, and so do I. God bless you.